Um, good, good afternoon. My name, or evening, I guess. My name is Ron Daniels. I'm an attorney down in middle Georgia. I do consumer protection. I do uh, habeas corpus defense on behalf of the state and some other local government work. Uh, I'm, I think this is my fourth or fifth year being a panelist here in the EFF track at Dragon Con. Um, last year I got to talk about this, but I was the moderator on the panel, so now I get to actually answer questions and offer thoughts other than just trying to spur on debate. So I uh, look forward to uh, this panel this evening and look forward to hopefully not uh, upsetting everybody in the room. My name is Dwayne Gatesell. I'm a lawyer in Austin, Texas, and I work primarily in intellectual property matters, so copyright, trademark, licensing, contracts, that sort of thing. And I think I've probably been here about the same amount of time doing uh, panel work for the EFF, probably four, five, six years, something like that. And uh, looking forward to it. It's always great to be here, and I appreciate all of you showing up instead of abandoning us for the, the bunny hutch prejudging outside. So thank you very much. It was a close call. Yeah. <laughs> I almost wore bunny ears and a bikini just for that reason, but thought, no, no one wants that. Somebody does. <laughs> uh, and, and I'll, I'll uh, take the disclaimer for Dwayne. Uh, we're both lawyers, uh, but uh, nothing that we say is legal advice. You're not our clients, uh, and none of our opinions or thoughts or answers reflect the opinions or thoughts and uh, our answers of our respective firms or any organizations we may or may not be a part of. Don't you just love lawyers? You, you could probably add more disclaimer on that. Than uh, we absolutely just that. could, <laughs> no, we, but we would be here all night. Right, exactly. You want to start us? Um, election law change is bad. I think we're done. <laughs> no, I mean, it, it's not too surprising what's going on nationwide. What's happening here in Georgia is happening nationwide. The more conservative the state, the more there are efforts to change voting laws in the effort of protecting elections or preventing people from voting, depending on your perspective. The interesting thing is, and I did not realize this, the number of states that have restricted access since the 2020 election are about 10 or 11. The number of states that have expanded access since the 2020 election are about 16 or 17. I didn't realize that when I started looking all this, this up and, and studying, because like Ron said, we handled this last year and the perspective was a little different. And in response, some states are actually saying, hey, maybe we should make elections easier. Maybe we should enable people to vote instead of restricting it. But it just depends on where you live. And unfortunately, Texas is one of those that, like Georgia, is doing some things that are really restrictive. The, the thing that I find interesting, and, and, and I was, I was hoping we would talk about it very quickly, and I'm just going to go straight to it. Is is the fascinating thing is we had the primaries back in May, and we actually saw a 212 percent increase in turnout uh, from prior primaries, and people really are undecided about why that is. Whether that is a reaction to to a perceived restriction on ballot access and trying to take away people's ability to vote, or whether that is a a coordinated response by you know action groups uh, the political parties themselves or campaigns or whether it is just some sort of anomaly uh, without any sort of statistical significance and I don't know what the answer is and I don't know that we're going to know what the answer is until we, we obviously have more data to look at but it is interesting uh, that for all of the you know I, I'd say all the, the criticisms of what Georgia passed, that you had that result uh, in a primary of 212 percent. That, mm -hmm. you know, that was sort of the thing that stuck out to me immediately. At the same time, you hear stories that you know somebody who voted absentee, their ballot wasn't received in a timely fashion, and so their vote didn't count. So, uh, in reality, that turnout could have been 230 percent or, or some other number. Right. You know, I don't have anything to back this up other than kind of a general faith in humanity. Uh, you know, I mean, you try cases, and when you try cases to a jury, you have a certain faith in humanity because when you put a bunch of strangers together, it's amazing how they try to do the right thing every time. 
you have these people, they're strangers to the case, they don't know the lawyers, they don't know the, the people that are involved in the case, and yet you put these strangers together and invariably they will try their best to figure out the proper solution. And I think it's really something similar with respect to voting. People in general, voting is important and people recognize that it's important, not only to them personally, but to this country as a whole. I mean, we're built upon that idea that all votes are supposed to be equal. And when you tell people, you know what, we're going to restrict the right, we're going to make it harder for you, we're going to make it more difficult, we're not going to have, <laughs> we're not going to have drop off boxes or, or all of that sort of thing. People realize this is important to them and to the society and to the country that they love, and so they are going to turn out and say, okay, fine, if you're going to mess with me in this respect, I'm going to show up and I'm going to actually exercise my right to vote as a citizen. And I have absolutely no data to base that on other than, again, faith in people that that's what they want to do. And by God, they're going to do it if people tell them that they can't. I mean, I'm, I, I, I like to personally have faith in humanity. Uh, it's difficult at times, but I, mean, I, I think that is, that is a probable reason for that. I mean, I, I, I don't know what the math is eventually going to bear out. You know, at some point in time, uh, I have a political science background. That's what I did in undergrad. I did, did a BS in political science, so it's hard numbers. It's not the philosophical end of it. At some point in time, somebody's going to have a grad paper on the effect of the Georgia uh, SB 202 on voter turnout, and they will have the math over a 10-year period. And, you know, obviously we don't have time machines, so we, we don't have that now. Um, but I, I, I do think that is a probable outcome. I think there are other potential probable outcomes of which one is the one that bears out. I don't know the answer to. Um, I do think it's somewhat interesting that, um, like a lot of laws, the, the, the Georgia law had bits and pieces of it where you would point to and say, well, this is actually a good thing. Um, and we talked about this last year, and the thing that I thought was really good is it expanded the early voting days. Right. Um, and, you know, I think I, I understand some people have this idea that you should only vote on one day and that's it. Um, and I just don't know that that's a workable thing in modern society. And I think having early voting is a good thing. I think it probably causes more money to be spent in campaigns, which is probably not a good thing. But... I think having the ability to go vote on a Saturday or a Sunday or, or you know, if you can get off on a, a Wednesday two weeks in advance instead of the Tuesday of, you know, that's a good idea in my opinion and, and, mm -hmm. and having more time for that is a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, until someone gets around to saying, you know what, Election Day really ought to be a federal holiday and everybody should have off so that everybody can vote on that day. Then, okay, maybe you can argue that everything should occur on one day. That would be mass chaos and I wouldn't personally want to wait in that line, but okay. But without that, yeah, I mean, who am I to say, oh, my work schedule should be the same as everybody else's. And if I can go vote at 10 a.m., you should go vote at 10 a.m. Well, it, it's a whole lot different for someone you know, working in a factory than it is for, you know, me sitting behind my desk going, yeah, sure, well, I can go now. And, and do you take a lot of federal holidays off? No. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's what I was thinking. Is, you know, federal holidays is a nice, very nice word, but when, you, when you're a lot of lawyers who are small business People, you know, we, I, I don't know when I last took an actual holiday. Uh, I am technically working on Labor Day because I'm doing panels uh, and I'm not just off, you know, doing completely nothing unwork related. And I guarantee you, even on Christmas Day, I probably am going to look at my phone and answer an email. So I don't, uh, and, yeah. and then, you know, you say, okay, well, it's a federal holiday. Well, that means the daycares are closed. And, you know, I love my three year old daughter to death, but. Um, my, my grandmother actually took her voting with her and she got like 15 I voted stickers which is probably the most <laughs> Dodge County thing ever um, but uh, I understand she did not pull any any levers or actually cast any ballots uh, thank goodness uh, but you know it, it, I, that's not something I necessarily want to do is take a toddler and I you imagine somebody that has multiple kids mm -hmm. you know it <laughs> you know the idea of reducing it to one federal holiday that 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 
probably does make it better for some people, but at the same time, it, I think it probably winds up being a wash. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. It, but it's one of those things that at least, you know, I'm not saying eliminate early voting entirely, right. but if you had that day, then for at least you're going to bring in more people. You're going to cast that net wider so that people would have the option. Uh, whereas now you really don't. You have this hodgepodge. You have you know, 50 different states and 50 different approaches to elections, and you know, what one does is different somewhere else. And yeah, it, it's just such a total mess of, okay, how do you exercise the key right as a citizen? So I say the poorer you are and the less your job pays, that's absolutely yeah. right. Why is physical presence necessary? I haven't set foot in a bank in 10 years, and my entire life savings is in that facility. Everything that I am is in there monetarily, yet I have to physically go to vote. Why would that be the case in this modern era? Honestly, because technologically for a country of 330 million, they haven't committed the time and resources to do it. There are other countries, particularly there's, uh, I forget what it is in the Baltics, uh, is it Latvia or Lithuania, that just did that where the entire vote was done electronically over the internet. But, I mean, you're talking about a country of, what, three or five million, something like that. Not to say that it's not possible. There are plenty of smart people in this country. There are plenty of smart people in this room that could probably figure that out. I mean... We have facial recognition on our phones, right? How hard could it be to do facial recognition for a ballot? It's, it's I, not like expertise. It's, it's the, even people highly, the, the experts are saying this is too easy to happen. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's just not, it cannot be made to go. I, I'm, it's, not, it's not that no one's taking a stab at it. It's that the people who would take a stab at it are saying this is the way to go. Yeah, I mean, this is, I'll let my cynicism show here. You, as the poli-sci major, are going to be more of the, the cynic than me. Um, uh, absolutely. I'm terrified of it. <laughs> I mean, I personally believe, okay, there's no technology that's ever completely 100% safe. And yet, okay, we trust this for banking. We trust this for communications. We trust this for you know, various you know, health care, all that sort of thing. So we as a society have made that decision that we are going to trust the internet for all of this stuff. Um, is there a risk of, of harm? Is there a risk of hacking? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, but there's a risk that someone will you know, vote twice also. That risk is so minuscule compared to the overall benefit that do you want to throw the baby out with the bathwater? I personally think the odds of someone hacking you know, change in the course of the entire election. Is it possible? Maybe, sure. But probably the odds are that small versus the benefit of actually getting in a huge number of people to vote. But unlike, so. unlike banking, the key with voting is you've got to be able to have a secure vote but not be able to prove who you voted for. Because that's the whole idea of an anonymous voting is I can't prove to the guy who's going to pay me 100 bucks for my vote. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's, that's a big part of it. That's why we had a lot of laws that were made, you know, 80 years ago, right? you couldn't sell your vote, and you today can't walk out with a receipt that says, I voted for uh, mm -hmm. right. Yeah. I mean, I guess that's part of the reason why Georgia changed you know, the law about you can't provide food or water to anyone. Oh, we're going to get there. Yeah. But we got another, we got another question. Yeah, before you answer that, I, I, the, the discussion is coming from the audience because I, I have the, the reflex memory that we're supposed to do this. Uh, the question is coming from the audience is, well, why are we requiring in-person voting rather than having some sort of electronic voting? And we've, we're sort of having a discussion about that. Right. I, I'm summarizing sort of the, the question, but the, somebody made the comment that the, we don't actually require physical presence. You can absentee ballot or, or vote uh, by by mail. If some 
don't call it absentee ballot. I think there's a few states that call it something else, but mm -hmm. right. you know, some other mechanism of voting. And you had a comment, but I just wanted to make sure we had the question for people watching on video. Yeah, I mean, again, I think there's a way that you can have electronic online voting and still protect the secrecy of the ballot to do so. Again, that mechanism has not been built, but I think it's possible. But I do believe there is a lack of political will, and again, this is the point I was getting to earlier about my cynicism, and that is a cynicism with respect to the people in power who have a vested interest, who don't want that. Um, because the more people that vote, there are, are certain groups who realize that they're not going to ever win an election, and so they don't want that. And so that, to me, is the underlying basis for all of the voter restrictions and restricted access that you see is the powerful who realize, ooh, things might be different for me tomorrow if we allow that. And again, I'll stop with my cynicism, but to me that seems very much what's going on. Uh, and before we take another question, I, I just want to kind of add that, you know, I, I online bank personally on my phone when I'm in town, but when I'm at my house, I can't. So, I mean, I, we don't have cell service or internet where I live sufficient that I can even log in and authenticate to a bank. And, that unfortunately is true of a lot of areas in the country and in Georgia in particular. I mean, we, we had kids that could not do e-learning without driving to the Waffle House and getting on the Wi-Fi or even driving to town and getting on my Wi-Fi at the office because we broadcasted a network. I mean, that, that is a very real problem in a lot yeah. of part of the state. Yeah, no, and that's definitely true. And it's something to, easy to overlook when you live in a large metropolitan area. And I forget exactly what the number is, but it's something like, I don't know, 75%, 80% have that kind of broadband access, which leaves a, you know, a significant percentage that, that does not. And so you're right, that is definitely a problem. So I want to make sure I understand the question correctly. It's uh, how how the law reduces evidentiary requirements in terms of. Gotcha. So, so the question is, what what the law does and what these type of laws do in respect of shifting the evidentiary burden for contesting a ballot for fraud or for some sort of collusion type of uh, thing in in harvesting the ballots. I think is the term that gets thrown around a lot, uh, and and off shifting the responsibilities. I think in Georgia in particular, the the it shifted it from the Secretary of State to a board created by the legislature which uh, the I believe the legislature has some appointees the governor lieutenant governor has an appointee and I think the secretary of state has either a representative or sits on the board too but it's sort of a way reduction of power mm -hmm. for the secretary of state right um, you want to answer the question or you want me to uh, I mean I, 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 I so my personal thought on this is um, I think it's funny whenever a party in power, anywhere, any time in history, any country, decides that we want to create an agency or a commission or authority or whatever you want to call it, board, and have political appointees to it because inevitably what happens in politics and history is you don't stay in power forever even if even if you, it's just kind of a 49, 51% type of back and forth, um, you know, and, and we see that a lot in the United States federal government, the executive agencies, um, you know, they rotate and they change a lot of policy and then they rotate again and they go backwards. And so I don't know how much sense that really makes. That's a personal belief. 
um, you know, the, at least with respect to the, and I forget what, I think they call it an elections board is what SB 202 styled it as, is elections supervision board. But uh, your thoughts, because I don't know what y'all have in Texas. Mm -hmm. it, it's been a very similar process where they, per, for example, you know, I, I have this whole list of things that uh, our governor, Greg Abbott, pushed through immediately. Um, and one of them was to, for example, ban officials from mailing unsolicited ballot applications with, with it, to anyone without asking. Uh, prohibits public officials from being able to, quote, facilitate the unsolicited distribution of absentee ballots uh, and empowers poll watchers to go wherever they want to and do whatever they want to as long as they don't, quote, break the law. Uh, there are new requirements for assisting voters. You have to you know, register if I'm helping someone who's unable to walk you know, to, the, to the poll. You have to register for that so I'm not you know, just trying to, to influence their vote. All of that speaks to this attempt to kind of, I don't even want to say legislate, because it's not really legislating. It's an attempt to control. And it's attempt to control, just like Ron said, from your own narrow perspective at that particular moment. Now, Texas, we're not in play yet, so it's probably safer from the thing that you're talking about where the parties are going to switch and go back and forth. I'm old enough that I remember when Texas was a democratic state for 100 years after Reconstruction. Um, and then that changed immediately, and they haven't looked back since, uh, which is hard for someone in Austin, which is this liberal enclave surrounded by you know, this sea of red. Um, but the intention is very obvious to separate that and take it out of the hands of whoever the politician might be hand it over to someone that's a political appointee so the politician himself, and it's almost always himself, uh, can wash his hands and say, it's not me, it's this, this board that's doing this. Well, yeah, but the board is handpicked by you, and so what do you expect that they're going to do? Again, I, just, I think it's this attempt to control things from people who profess love for their country but don't really love the country, they love the power that the country provides to them. I, I will say that the other part of the question, I, I still think it's very difficult to challenge a ballot and to challenge the outcome of election in the state of Georgia. Um, I, I'm, I mean, I, I've litigated those things. Uh, it's never been easy. It's, it's always been a pretty difficult thing to do. Um, I, I will say, though, that, you know, and, and I know we're going to differ about this. I, I think having a rule book about these are the times you can mail out absentee ballot applications or these are how you know you, you can have a, a a box to pick up you know to drop ballots off I think it's important to have something that says you know yes you can do that or these are the way you do that I don't know that I necessarily agree with what was the final product in terms of getting passed by the legislature but you know going from having no mention at all of a of a ballot drop-off box to all of a sudden uh, you know everybody's putting them wherever they want to I, from my perspective and from the lawyers I deal with and and, and the, even the campaigns I've, I've ever dealt with we like having a, a you know not necessarily a playbook but a rule book um, and we might argue about a sentence or two in the rule book but we like to know what the confines that we're supposed to operate in yeah. And I think that's true of lawyers generally yeah. too. Is you know we we like the law. We we might disagree with the law, but we like knowing what what we're working in. Uh, and so I I don't know that I think it's a bad idea to put that into law. Um, I don't know that I agree that you know you can should only have X number of ballot boxes per capita or something like that. I, I don't know what the right number is, but I, I think having some sort of structure is a good idea. Yeah, I mean, all lawyers, we believe in rule of law because we know without that rule of law, you have chaos. And if you really want to live in Afghanistan, you can kind of you know, see what what happens without the rule of law. Um, and I'm not big on, I'm not advocating, let's, let's go to warlordism. Um, so I do like rule of law. On the other hand, you know, Texas, for example, decided, okay, we can have one ballot box, you know, one drop-off box, and only one in a city the size of Houston, say, 
you are asking for complete trouble. And that's ridiculous. I agree with you. There's a difference between having rules and there's a difference in draconian rules or ridiculous rules. And therein lies the problem. Yeah, people can have an honest debate about that. But saying, you know, Houston, a city of three million or whatever, that yes, we're going to have one drop-off box for ballots, we all know what that's intended to do. I mean, it's just, it's as plain as it that's could possibly be. What's that? That's not even a debate. No, it's not, you know, to any reasonable person. But, you know, having, having a debate with a zealot, as everyone knows, is pointless. You know, you can say the sky is blue and the zealot is going to say, no, it's red. And you all the facts and evidence to the contrary. It doesn't matter. You know, they're going to believe what they're going to believe because they've drunk the Kool-Aid, and that is that, and you can't have that honest discussion or debate. And that's part of the problem with what's going on generally, whether it's this issue or a lot of the other things that we talk about here, is this kind of polarization into camps of zealotry where you can't have an honest discussion. You can't say, oh, yeah, let me th I haven't thought about that before. If you come to a, an issue with your mind made up, you know, whether it's this or anything else, it's problematic. Can you talk about the prospect for successful litigation on these topics? So I'm from Missouri. We passed a similar post suppression law. One of the things it does is make it a felony to solicit an absentee ballot that's solicited to the side. So, of course, under the criminal code, it's uh, very broad. Mm -hmm. um, and so there is ongoing litigation to determine what that means. Um, but it's a back and forth, always lots of, uh, you know, lots of lawyers in court, um, and right. the state courts are not. So I can tell you what's going on. The question is, what what's the sort of the potential outcomes of, of challenges, legal challenges to uh, Georgia's election law and other similar laws? I, I can tell you because I, I actually did a little bit of studying while I was waiting for a jury verdict yesterday. Um, and, and I kind of kept up with what's going on with uh, Georgia's law. It, it, we're going to use it in November. That's what the, the rule is right now. Um, there are some things that it pretty clear the federal judge that has been assigned all the cases uh, thus far. Uh, if you read between the lines in his opinions, I, I think it's pretty clear the things he believes there's issues with. Uh, and in the first one, we already mentioned it a little bit. Um, the first thing that we, you know, we mentioned a little bit a while ago was the supplying water or food while somebody's in the voting line. And the thing that I said last year at this panel, I think is where you know, the, the rubber is going to meet the road, really, in that is um, this idea that you can't give somebody water or food 25 foot from the line. Well, the line is not a stationary thing. Um, it moves. Uh, and so I, I said I thought that was probably going to be unconstitutional because of vagueness, uh, because the line is this organic thing. You know, it's one thing to say there's no soliciting of votes 140 feet from the polling place and you go 140 feet from the door, but when the line comes 200 feet out the door, um, can you go up to somebody that's in the line that's, 202 feet, they're not 140 feet, so you got 62 feet there. Um, yeah, it's pretty clear from the opinion that he thinks that's questionable, uh, and whether or not the 11th Circuit thinks it's questionable and then the Supreme Court thinks it's questionable, I don't know. Um, but, I, you know, I, I, think there, I think there is some problem with that just because the idea of of the zone of supplication, I guess we'll call it, you know, it changes. Um, and that is a problem. That's that's a big red flag to me that there's something there that's just not constitutionally workable. Right. Um, are there other issues with it? I'm going to let you chime in because I know you had a good answer <laughs> last year. <laughs> well, I, something like that, I mean, l let's just talk about the food and water. This goes back to my point earlier about faith in humanity. The notion that someone is going to change their vote over a cup of water is absurd. It's like, you know, I was going to vote for Joe Biden, but gosh, this water is good. I'm going to vote for Donald Trump. Please. That, that cynicism on the part of the powers that be that are, you know, it's a solution in search of a problem. That is not a problem. 
voting is important to people. People who line up and wait for a couple of hours are not going to change their vote over, gosh, you know, do I pass out or do I accept a, a cup of water? It's not going to happen. It's ridiculous. And so that kind of thing, to me, again, is just, it's this cynicism on the part of people in control. Um, but I wanted to answer your question with respect to where I think litigation is going to go on this. It used to be, and then all parties, you know, it's like with gerrymandering, all parties have played that game. Nobody is pure when it comes to that. But there are certain parties that have kind of perfected that to an art. We see now, for example, with the Supreme Court, where progressive ideas are now going to die. So with respect to this voting issue, if it comes to that, how do I think a 6-3 Supreme Court is going to decide? I have to be very, very pessimistic about that and say, oh, yeah, voter restrictions, yeah, that's fine, because it's within the sphere of what states are allowed to do under the law. You know, if there was a federal law that was uniform across the country and that had been passed by Congress, okay, maybe, although, you know, as we've seen, like with abortion, okay, fine, we have our activist mentality, we're going to change what the, the law previously was. They could do that with, with voting issues as well, but it's harder when there's actually you know, a federal law that has been passed. So if we had uniformity, it would be harder for the Supreme Court, for example, or the 11th Circuit to change it. But generally speaking, I, I am afraid as these cases go forward that there will be just the rubber stamping of the restrictive issues, unfortunately. Uh, and, and, and now we have a microphone, so if oh, you yeah. have questions, it's come on down time. So don't be shy. Hi, my name is Doug. I'm an attorney here in Georgia. My question is um, whether y'all think that the documentary 2000 Mules by Dinesh D'Souza uncovered significant voter fraud. I honestly haven't seen it, um, so I, I don't, I can't give an answer one way or the other. I mean, I'm not that familiar with it, but there's been no real instance of uncovering a whole lot of voter fraud uh, in any example. You know, there was, there was one example in Texas with the last election, there was a Republican that I think had convinced his mother to, to vote, or he voted twice. It just, again, it, it's such anecdotal things that okay, fine, I could be presented with evidence and believe to the contrary, but up till now, there has not been any widespread examples of voter fraud. Again, a handful out of millions and millions and millions of ballots cast. So. Well, and, and, and I'll say too, you know, I, I don't like the word fraud because I think sometimes we conflate what, I think we conflate ideas. What I understand to be the biggest criticism of the 2020 elections to be, to me, is something that doesn't sound a fraud. It sounds in, you know, in more of a, a system of, you know, this is how we're going to gather votes and, and get them in. It's, it's more of a, it's not fraud. Fraud to me requires some artifice of we are going to, you know, get your ballot and change the vote on it. That's one thing. What I understand usually to be the criticism of, of, of what is alleged to occur is more we're going to go and get people who would not otherwise vote to vote and mail-in votes. And so I, you know, when I hear the word fraud, I'm, I don't know that you could ever show that you know, the, what we consider in the law is fraud versus what a layperson considers to be fraud are two very different things is what I'm getting at. And so. I, anytime I get thrown that word, I just kind of give that, you know, don't know that we're talking about the same thing. Yeah, no, that, um, that's fair. That tends to be a kind of an umbrella, and it's not technically fraud. You can have an honest debate, again, you know, should you have a get out the boat drive where you pick people up in a bus and you drive them there, you know, should that be allowed or not? But you're right, it's not fraud. Yeah. So. And again, that goes back to, you know, here's the rule book. You know, are, are you violating the rule book or you're not? That, mm -hmm. That's the... Right. Yes, sir. I, I think the law on the cup of water to people in line, I think it goes beyond cynicism. I think it's 
a, a way to induce people at the end of the line that have been standing for hours and hours in the heat to, to give up and go home. Absolutely. So, in, so that's, that, that's, I think, was the motivating factor. My question is, um, can you to address the law that the Georgia State Legislature can, based on a suspicion, this is the way I understand it, can replace a county election board? And is that law still going to be, wh what do you think the impact is? And is that law still going to be in effect in Georgia this November? Yeah, the, the law's going to be in effect. It, it didn't get kicked out. Um, what I think the effect is going to be, I, you know, it, it's, I think it's one of those things that gets passed to make people have something to talk about to make them feel good. I mean, it's really a nuclear option. Um, and the thing about nuclear options is usually people don't use a nuclear option. You, usually, usually. Um, so, so you don't think that a Republican-dominated legislature has the motivation to replace an election board in a heavily Democratic county? I mean, all they need, as I understand it, is suspicion of fraud. They don't need to have evidence. So you don't think that's a factor here? I, I think it could be, but, but what I was getting to is there, there are procedures. There's, you know, let's say they do that. Right. But let, let's go full cynicism and say that's exactly what's going to happen. And it may not be cynicism to say that that's what's going to happen. There are procedures that they could then challenge whoever they put in that spot and say, no, I was wrongfully removed. So I, I don't know how well that's actually going to play out is what I was ultimately getting to. You know, whether they do it or not, uh, whether they pull the nuclear trigger or not on something like that, I don't know how it ultimately plays out when somebody can go back and then challenge what they've done. And then we get to the problem that we talked about earlier, like I, I don't believe that one political party is going to stay in control of any state forever um you know Except maybe I, I am old <laughs> enough to remember when the state of georgia was a solidly democratic state um i am not old enough to remember when texas was uh, nor did i concern Thank myself with texas at that time Thanks, um, i appreciate that but but you know it, it hasn't been 25 years um and you know, if you look at the trends uh, it's not going to be 25 more years before that flips and if that's the case or you get to a split legislature, then then what happens? You know, that's sort of the the quandary I, I find ourselves in. I don't know that there's a I don't know that there's a good legal basis to challenge it until it happens. So I think that's the problem with that type of law is you you've got to have. Well, but what what is the legal challenge if it's in the law that they can just put in the handpicked people instead of the elected, you know, election board? what's the basis of the challenge because the, it, they can legally do that they can put people in and I don't understand what you're saying the challenge is since, since it's legal for them to do that it's a quo warranto action uh, I don't know what that means so it's 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 an old Latin term but basically what it what it boils down to is a person that gets removed from office you can either use a quo warranto action to remove somebody from office or if you've been defrocked so say um, you can go back and challenge say no the person that's now in office shouldn't be in office and so that's something that would be litigated at a county superior court level so i don't understand what you're saying you're saying that they okay i, I just i just want to understand what your, your response is that you're saying the replacements would be challenged because they've already if, I don't the the person that gets removed can challenge their replacement or, or just the citizens of that county could challenge okay, the replacement. Okay, I understand what you meant. Yeah, okay, so thank it's you. like, yeah, it could happen. There might be a wrongful dismissal suit. Yeah, as a result. Yeah, just, I mean, just same employment yeah. context. Yeah. You know, so. yeah. You keep saying honest debate, and I'm going to question that mm -hmm. when we have, uh, as you said, historically, no one's hands are clean, but at present, we have one side actively creating or at least amplifying conspiracy theories and creating an entirely alternate set of facts and then using that to stoke the fears to push through these brand new policies, uh, typically at the expense of women and minorities. So how do you go about having an honest debate when you can't even agree on common ground? I don't know. Thank you. Well, I mean, I, 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 
the corollary to that is, I, I mean, me and him have pretty open and honest debates, mm -hmm. but you know, sometimes I take positions just to, so we can have a debate. But but you, you agree know, on reality? Yeah, well, I mean, Pre presumably, I do. Yes, I do. I have a three-year-old, so <laughs> let's let's not assume I agree on reality. Yes, but she voted fifteen times. Yes, <laughs> but she's from Dodge County, and that's okay still. All right. Also, we got in trouble for giving people liquor in the voting line. So, I, what I, I don't know, unless you know somebody's turning it into wine. Go figure. Go figure. Thank you. I think the answer to your question ultimately is you make people laugh and then you find common ground. Uh, it's my understanding that the Georgia voter law creates some sort of right of action for one citizen to challenge the voting status of another citizen. Is that accurate? And if so, um, can you explain that? That is in there. Um, I don't know of a single time anybody has used it yet. Okay. But there may be some. Okay. Um, it, We'll see. Is that what you're saying? I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I think, I and mean, how how that works and what it looks like, it would have somebody would actually have to do it and have to go to the Georgia Supreme Court. And I'm just not, I'm not familiar that that's happened. It may have. Okay, it has happened. So. Sure. Um, so apparently it happened at some point during the primary. Approximately 15,000 people were challenged. What happened is there's some sort of administrative procedure. They can take in some sort of information to the, the county voting office and... Okay, so you, you get a letter if you've been challenged. You can then go to your polling place and provide them some sort of information as requesting a letter and clear it up, <laughs> which assumes that you check your mail and uh, actually get your mail. You would be told because it comes up on the board. Got you. You would be told at the polling place 90% of the time it's, oh, can you bring us this piece of information or that piece of information? If you don't have that information with you, you can go to the mail and you have so so even more administrative headache yeah. if you wind up at the poll you have not gotten the letter saying hey your status has been challenged you can cast a provisional ballot and then bring some form of documentation they request by the following Friday and your vote will actually count so that's very informative thank you I'm glad somebody had an answer because yeah no, that's let's, let's get a round of applause for the audience exactly very nice so kind of a follow-up on that question and on their information are there any other uh, realistic challenges that you think that we're going to encounter in November for people wanting to vote and what can we do to um, counteract those I mean register early request absentee ballots at the proper time don't wait um, you know, don't count on having a lot of drop boxes. Um, basically, yeah, plan ahead and just don't put it off because, yeah, they're they're stacking the deck against you. Vote often, vote early. Well, and there there's a uh, page. It's the My Voter page on the Secretary of State's website. It's actually a really good tool. Uh, it it tells you it in, it should tell you where where your polling precinct mm -hmm. is. I understand sometimes counties move those. Um, but it, it does have a lot of information. You can check your status. Uh, and you can also request to have to see balance there if that's something you want to do or need to do. Um, so, I mean, they, they have gotten a little bit technologically better about doing those things in the Secretary of State's office. Can I come to your, your office to use your Wi-Fi? <laughs> if you want to drive to Eastman, Georgia, come on. You can use my Wi-Fi. I will take you to the coffee shop. You can buy your own cup of coffee. They are clients. They are great clients. They make really good coffee. It comes from Athens. Thank you.
Thanks. So, a little bit more of a comment than, than a question, but you were talking about the, with the other gentleman taking that nuclear option, and yeah, there are legal routes you could take potentially to return that, but I don't think that's the point. By that time, the damage is already done. Like the the doubt has already been cast, and I think the question that I hear asked a lot is. Is, is that not what a lot of these voter restrictions are? Not so much like so that it will be legally held up, but more to cast doubt on the process, make the process a little more dubious. You said it's hard to challenge a vote. I would say it's, or challenge election. I would say it's easy to challenge an election. It's hard to substantially or have a challenge substantiate an election. But I don't think that's the point of these laws. It's more to seed chaos. I totally agree. I don't know that I disagree with that. I mean, no, I mean, th that's the whole purpose. It's to dissuade, to discourage, to disappoint, to frustrate, to cause, you know, women and minorities and people of color to say, you know, I can't get off of work, or this is too onerous, or it takes too much time, or it's too much of a hassle, or I don't have the resources to fight it, mm -hmm. or whatever else. Of course, it's, you know. Is that not covered, though, under the constitutional right to vote and the freedom to vote? Like, there's got to be a legal way that that stuff for anything that you're on, yeah. You would think so, but not really. <laughs> not really. Uh, I think a lot of this has just kind of been built on trust, that there's this assumption that everyone's going to play fair and that, you know, yes, it is one person, one vote. And then certain people have figured out, well, it's not really in there. So, yes, I can game the system and I can get away with it until the masses of people kind of rise up, I'm not advocating revolution, but enough people vote out the scoundrels basically to say, okay, we, we've got to do something that's fair. But yeah, I think you're right. I mean, we're, we're only 75 years removed from the white only primaries yeah. in Georgia. Yeah. So wow. I mean, not, not, not 100 years yet. Yeah. yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, have the Georgia gerrymandering laws, um, are they being scrutinized at, on any federal level? And also the new voting machines, where it does give you a, a piece of paper and then you slide it in with the barcodes. What are your thoughts on those? And if there are issues, uh, is Stacey Abrams aware of any of these issues? I know she's really good at voting issues. So I guess that was kind of a twofold question there. Okay. Um, I did gerrymandering last year, and I'm not aware of any, any scrutiny of Georgia gerrymandering laws right now. Not to say that it won't happen, but I'm not aware of any case going there, on There right actually now. is one. Is there? Uh, yes. Um, the Public Service Commission <laughs> race is, a, is currently a mess because of some of those issues. So um, I, I would say, yes, there are some challenges. They are being litigated. Um, but nothing decided yet, right? Oh, well, the, pub the public service commission race is it, it is up in the air. Um, let's just that that's the short form answer because we have got ten minutes and I could probably talk in thirty minutes about that. But because um, it's really interesting, actually. Uh, but it, just in respect to congressional districts and, and state house, state senate districts, there's probably not going to be a good challenge to it because I mean ultimately in the, the day you gave this presentation last year about gerrymandering it kind of I mean you get in a tough spot with drawing congressional districts and state house districts it, it it's unfortunately the laws are written that you have to do certain things and sometimes there's not a good way to do it um, you know it would be nice if we could just cut a pie and have equal space but we can't and you know we have a state house and a state senate that are both apportioned by population they're not apportioned like the united states senate and the house of representatives by population and then by you know two per each state so you know everything has to be proportioned to population based on on numbers and sometimes that means that you've got some really wonky looking districts mm -hmm. um that, that's just an unfortunate reality sometimes uh, even if there are really no if you kept everything the same nobody gains a district nobody loses a district some sometimes that means they're going to be a boomerang and then there's going to be something that's got a little you know, trying to keep those numbers balanced that's difficult yeah
It absolutely is. It absolutely is. Yeah. You can, and it just depends on the state. It depends on the criteria that they use for the gerrymandering. Um, and, yeah. yeah. Um, to answer your second question, I'm sorry, it was on the um, the voting machines like yeah, using the bark. Right. The, the question was with respect to what do we think about using the, the voting machines that will print out a ballot and will have a Q, uh, usually a QR code that you then feed into the, the thing. I mean, that, that's possible to abuse also. I mean, you can imagine a situation where a QR code comes out and nobody can read that thing. And so you scan it in and the QR code has been hijacked to vote for the opponent. That's certainly a possibility. And experts have shown that it's, it's relatively easy to do. And this is one of the things that actually is beneficial to having this kind of patchwork quilt of elections that we do, that you might be able to change something locally, but the, the odds of being able to change something on a, a more global scale as a result of that would be very, very difficult. But it's certainly a possibility. It's just something that hasn't been done in an election, but that is a risk of using the QR codes. Sorry. Sorry, let me get to the question the sure. man here at the line. Well, one comment, one question. Um, talking about the nuclear option, the Secretary of State had that ability to remove a, an election supervisor before. You know, so the nuclear option's always been there. And we had just last election, Floyd County, he didn't use it, but he threatened it. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea was he, he told the local county commission, yeah, you've got an election supervisor who's an idiot. You know, he was incompetent. And so instead of the Secretary of State removing him, he just publicly said that and then the local county commission you know kicked him out so even with it there it wasn't used it was used as leverage uh, my question I'm a poll manager here in Georgia you know what can you speak to about Boy County Cobb okay um, what can you speak to about things inside the poll regarding the uh, SB 202 you know in terms of things like you know the water outside is not such a big deal, but empowering or changing the rules for poll watchers, you know, inside the poll, you know, and that, that can potentially be a real problem for somebody trying to run an election in the poll if I've got poll watchers who suddenly have new powers. Mm-hmm. I, 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 my, you know, it, that, that's, that's a really complicated question. I mean, you, you know that. Um, <laughs> I think it's problematic what we have. I, mean, I think that's the short answer is, you know, and I don't know how much of it's going to stand up in terms of inside, you know, what, yeah, in, in, inside the enclosed space. Uh, what I will say is it, it's sort of fascinating to me just sort of the disparity across Georgia because we have 159 counties, um, some of which are very small, some of which like Cobb are very large. Um, and, you know, we can vote 14,000 people in Blackwood County uh, in a day like clockwork, and you've got precincts, I know, in Cobb County that you probably have a line twice as long as we have at any point in time of the day all day long. Um, and it doesn't really matter how, how much you shrink or how many precincts you add or things like that. It's a problem. And then when you add in people that are third parties, they're poll watchers, um, you, you add all sorts of pro problems, and I, I, you know, and and I think poll watchers can serve sometimes uh, can be useful, um, but I, I think at other times they they are extra bodies in the space that can cause problems. And when you give them powers and things like that, I think there's a potential that there could be issues, in, including you know if they're trying to supply people water or things like that to keep somebody from fainting or, or whatever issue is so I, I I don't know what the right answer is I think it's you know I I think we're just gonna have to see I mean it's, I, what I do know is nothing's going to be done before this next election but I, I think one of the things that that everybody sits back and holds their breath with and us as lawyers is um, we like to see what happens when you pass these laws and actually how it works out um, you know, we, we are pretty good at future proofing a lot of problems and seeing constitutional issues about, oh, but this is really vague language or this is, you know, just structurally wrong in a law. But there's some things that are just you don't see until it's an application. Uh, and my favorite example is in, in 2010, I think, 
the Georgia legislature revamped a bunch of fees and one of the fees they revamped was the filing fee to file a civil case which had been $88 forever and ever and ever and they bumped it up to $205 which is more in line they also increased the inspection fee to go check a runway which was $50 to something like 300 and some odd dollars which makes a whole lot more sense um, unintentionally they increased the fee to apply and become a notary public from $50 to $250 uh, so you know, sometimes we've got to see how things work out um, to see what the issues are with them. Um, that's just from the legal perspective. And, uh, I would probably answer the question a little bit differently. To me, the notion of allowing partisan poll watchers in to that process is a very bad idea. I think you ought to be able to do your job without someone looking over your shoulder and you know, saying, hey, what would you do? Why would you do that? Where are you going? Where, do, how, where are you taking this? that's asking for a problem and again it's a solution in search of a problem not an actual problem there's been again no documented instances of poll managers you know altering ballots or you know destroying things despite all the the nonsense and the conspiracy talk so my feeling is on something like this I don't have to wait and see how this particular issue is going to work out I know how this is going to work out in Texas Having partisan poll watchers given free access to polling places is going to cause a problem. A fight is going to break out somewhere. Someone is going to throw a punch. Someone is going to say something stupid. And I feel like... Wait, in Texas? Yeah, it's hard, it's hard to believe. I know. I know. My feeling is, hey, you know, kudos to you. You should be able to do your job without someone... But that's me. But we also had third parties that were nonpartisan, even in the 2020 election in Georgia, that... Uh, supplied, for instance, lawyers as poll watchers who were there to assist, you know, the, the polling managers. And yeah, I, I can't say that those people are not helpful. Mm -hmm. If they're sitting there and assisting them and giving them legal guidance, you know, yes, I can see what you're saying as well. But I, at the same time, like I, I, I think generally it's just a bad idea to have a bunch of people hovering around. I mean, I totally agree. I mean, that was before COVID opinion. That's still my opinion now, but. You know, I, I think ultimately to, to see how it's going to shake out, I think you're just going to we're going to have to have a test case. The uh, write up for the panel specifically mentions uh, ballot marking device voting machines. Uh, I've never heard that term before. I do live here in Georgia. I, is that the QR code machines? And can you expound a little bit on just that tidbit? There, there are different types of machines. You know, some have the QR codes, some don't. Some will print out, you know, the names of who you voted for, some don't. Uh, so the ballot marking machines is just whatever the mechanism might be. And they're all different ways. Of I mean, that even that. includes the old school machine where you turn yeah. it and it punches it in. Yeah. I mean, because it's marking the ballot. Yeah, exactly. And there are, there are problems with any of them. You know, and yes, you can make them more sophisticated but they can also be susceptible to hacking, like with the QR thing that we talked about. And so, you know, I was reading an article about this as far as what the, the best thing to do is, and it actually was more of kind of the, the old tech solution, that if you just do everything by hand, then you don't have any problem with technology, but then you're gonna slow the process down, you can't tabulate as fast, and you end up you know, taking six weeks to figure out the votes instead of the man like in Georgia I think it has to be done within I think five days or so I, I'm uh, sure our gentleman from Cobb County was proud to know that Cobb County is not one of the ones that takes a long time to certify the votes so <laughs> but we do have some right right so, um, I have two questions so one question is when I, the current place where I vote they print out the can y'all hear me mm -hmm. no okay so the where I vote, they print out the names who, who you voted for, and there's someone standing there watching, looking at, as she feeds it into the machine, looking at all the names. Um, it gets worse. Okay, I used to vote in Gwinnett, and that was simple, Gwinnett County, um, I always had privacy, uh, meaning no one was standing behind me. Every single place I vote for now in Fulton County, um, there's like five or six machines, and all but one is viewable by other people. And it's very concerning to me I'm planning to bring a hoodie next time so I can do like this. I do not want people to know who I voted for just based, I don't want it advertised on social media, you know, the next mm. morning. Oh, this person <laughs> voted for. Right. Um, so that's one, con so that's not right, correct? That's no, okay. that's, no. that's not so, right. Okay. That, is no. that goes against federal election law. Yeah. Okay, so I'll bring that up next time I go to that polling. So Absolutely. The ne my next concern, uh, again, uh, privacy. 
uh, the My Georgia Voter page. Um, you can, if you know my name and you know my address, which, thank you, Georgia, that's now public information, um, you can actually run a cron job on a website because, hey, you know, unlimited logins and find out my birthday. I'm not too comfortable with that. Uh, that's a little bit too much, you know, information together. Uh, right now I do other things. I use other people's uh, zip code as my own zip code so that you can't access my credit card because my zip code is now public. Um, so that, you know, if they make my birthday public, they have my name, my the, the correct spelling of my name on my Georgia website. That's just a little too much information. Is anyone else concerned about that? I don't know if that's a protectable issue or not, honestly. See, here where you go back to real cynicism because th this is why <laughs> we get these discussions. This is the healthy debate we wanted. Um, you know, I personally think so. Um, I, I I try not to use this stuff as much as as I can. Like I I run away from it as much as I can. It's unfortunate that I have to a lot. I mean, to bank and do things. I mean, it's just it, it it's it's so inconvenient to not to. But I mean, that's one of the things that concerns me is how much of my information is out there at any given time. So uh, yeah, it's concerning to me. That I think the problem is it's always a tension and a trying to balance of you know how convenient can we make things where it's we're not you know not restricting somebody's ability to vote and and give you access to these tools to, that arguably should help you uh, at the same time we've got to protect your information so I guess if a bank if I see that a bank is giving out too much of my information I can switch banks I cannot do choose not to do business with that private entity in this case if I want to vote and I have a friend who won't vote, but you know, he's in security. So if I choose to vote, which I do, then now my information's out there. And it shows that I'm active voter. So it, it could show I, that I'm inactive. And then, you know, people Well, would that information too has been available to any party that, you know, they, they have access to voter vault. They know when somebody cast a ballot. They don't know who you vote for, but right. if you voted in a Republican primary or a Democratic primary, um, they generally know that, and that's how they send you those mailers. Usually, is you know they've identified you as a probable voter that you're going to vote Democrat, and so they're going to send out this back, but you know batch of mailers based on other demographics. I mean, yeah, it's yeah. So I guess that the active part or inactive wasn't my biggest concern. It's my con the concern they know my birthday, that they're able to hack the website to, to you know, figure out my date of birth. That's my that's my biggest concern. I don't know the answer to this question. Mm -hmm. um, I I do wonder whether it's possible to contact the website under their data privacy policies to say, I want this information hidden from public view. I don't oh, that's know. A good idea. I don't know if it's possible, but it might yeah. be. Okay. All right. Thank you. So there you go. Audience member says yes, it is possible. Hmm. Interesting. We are now out of time. I want to thank everyone for attending. For all of your uh, good questions, thank you so much. Have a good con. Remember to rate the panel. <laughs>